Good morning, Mission. Good morning, good morning. It's great to see you, each and every one of you, all of you, and those of you uh, who are with us online. It is awesome to be here. And one of the things that, uh, as a community of Christ followers who are committed to being real with God and real with each other and real in the world, when we gather and we get a chance to celebrate what God has done, especially at this time of year, it's something that's it's really, really poignant. This is an opportunity for us to tune our hearts to what God is all about. And that is why we're all about this, this theme of fix your eyes on Jesus. Uh, Hebrews 12 is the is the passage that leads us to that reality, to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And so today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be reading these two passages, one a Psalm of David and the other from Dr. Luke who gave a, 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 a historic outlook on the life and ministry of Jesus. And so we're going to be reading from these. We're going to be spending most of our time today in Psalm 86. But if you could stand as we read both of these passages. And we're going to read a little bit more than what's on the screen here. Um, we're going to start um, in chapter 86 at verse 1. This is a prayer of David. Hear me, Lord. Answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call on you. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. When I am in distress, I call to you because you answer to me. Because you answer me. Among the gods, there is none like you, Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name, for you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, Lord that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. And then from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, and we're going to begin actually in verse 8 and go all the way to 12. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. If you've been paying attention as we've been going through this series where we were talking about that, the epicenter of our focus as followers of Jesus and the epicenter of Christmas as a follower of Jesus, it's fixing our eyes on Jesus. And that actually gives us the the capability and the resources to navigate some of the more difficult aspects of this season. And we're just following the Advent calendar, focusing in on hope, peace, joy, the next week, love. But hope, we wanted to focus in on the fact that we have hope as followers of Jesus who have the hope despite discouragement. Everyone goes through different seasons of discouragement. Many of you today walk into this room lagging behind you, dragging behind you elements of difficulty and pain and stress and anxiety, and you're bringing that in here because you know that Jesus is your answer. Mission isn't your answer. Jesus is your answer. And so we have hope in him despite discouragement. Peace despite demands. This is an incredibly demanding season, and, and the anxiety that gets layered upon layered, not just for adults, not just for high school students, not just for junior high school students, but all the way down to kids is overwhelming. But in Jesus, we have a unique brand of peace that is second to none. And then fi- and finally, what we're going to be talking about today is joy despite distractions. Distractions. We live in a distracted time, don't we? Yeah. Like nobody disagrees with that. Isn't that weird? Like that's like something that's like everyone's like, yeah, it's true. And then like even if they don't, they're like, oh wait, what? I wasn't paying attention. Oh yeah, that is true. We're distracted. Distractions are like all over the place. Some of you are clinically distracted. And some of you haven't been diagnosed yet like me. But you grew up knowing what distraction was. I was a kid that teachers liked me. They said, he's a nice boy. Just kind of distracted. That was just, that's what they put in the report cards. When I, I hated book assignments. Some of you are are nerdy people that loved book assignments. I I envy you. I don't hate on you. I envy you because I hated reading a book. I I wanted to be one of those people that loved going to the library and checking out a book and carrying it home and opening it up and like, oh, I think I'll read two more today. I I wanted to be that guy. And some of you are that person. But for me, I would get to a page 
usually page one. And I would start on page one, and I would start going down, and I'd get to the bottom and realize I have no idea what was on that page. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to start again because this time it's going to be different. And I'd go through that like 50 times. I'm like, why is it that I'm not retaining anything? And I'll tell you why. I was distracted. I loved it when my mom read me books. I wasn't an anti-book. I love books. When my mom read me books, I loved it when the teacher read me books. Somebody created a business plan because they heard my story. And they created this thing to read books to people who can't read well. And they called it Audible. So you're welcome. And so like, this is like the amazing thing is that we have a culture that is absolutely distracted. And that's, I mean, if it's just being distracted from things like, you know, reading Tom Sawyer or something, no big deal. But the truth is, is as humans, we wrestle with distraction, distracting us from the essence of life itself and what God has brought us, including, including joy. One of the things that um, this particular guy, his name um, is, well, let me get his name here. Uh, I'm going to miss his name. Corey Pemberton. Corey Pemberton is an individual from Freedom Time Management. He said this about distraction, and I love this. Distraction isn't a lack of focus, which makes me feel temporarily good about myself. I'm still focused. Distraction isn't a lack of focus. It's simply allowing oneself to focus on something other than the task at hand. So it's not a lack of focus. It's just like, it's just a, a, a lack of maintaining a focus on the things that matter. And again, the thing we're talking about today that distraction can rob us from is the reality of joy. And again, not a big deal if you're distracted from something that's a menial task or it's not a big deal. But if you're getting distracted from the thing, the very thing that God came to bring you, I mean, again, this is what the angel said. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid for behold, I bring you good news of mediocre joy. I bring you good news of, it's okay, joy. What kind of joy? qualitatively better than anything that's good. Great joy, which will be for all men. Which will be for all rich. Which will be for all put together. No, it's for who? All the people. Why is this good news? Because it is good news for all the people. That's why there's joy. And the great thing about joy is that, honestly, in English, we oftentimes make joy synonymous with happiness, but it's not. You've probably heard this before, but joy is better than happiness. It's greater than it. Because happiness is what happens when things go my way. Happiness is what happens when your relationship happens to be in a good place. And you're happy. Happiness is what happens when your grades are decent. And because of that, you're happy. Happiness is what happens when you get respect you deserve or you get acknowledged or props or promotions or whatever. When that happens, you're happy. Happiness is what happens when things go your way. But if you've lived old enough to realize this, or if you haven't, you should. The reality is, is that a lot of life isn't happy. A lot of life is the pursuit of happiness, but you get it and it's fragile. Or you get it and it's fleeting. It's momentary. And so what a lot of human beings do as they get into from, you know, kids to teenagers to adults and on is they make their pursuit of their life the pursuit of happiness. And they end up incredibly demoralized by that, discouraged and put out because life was not created for this pursuit of this temporary thing that I can acquire and hold on to and enjoy and then it's over. Instead, I was created for something much more resilient and that is joy. The crazy thing about joy being greater than happiness is this. In order to be happy, things have to be going well. In order for you to be happy, things have to be going well. But you could be joyful and things could be garbage. You could actually not have conditions that would make you happy and still have the joy of the Lord. For 2,000 years, Christians have taken that message from those angels to heart. When they have been persecuted, when they have been fired, when they have been on the receiving end of injustice, and they have not been happy about their circumstances. They're not voting for these circumstances as the way to win and feel an awesome degree of life happiness. It isn't happy, but they can be joy-filled in the midst of it. So today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at Psalm 86. The thing that, that is talking about this, the psalmist David asking God for this we're going to talk about what the enemy of this is and the remedy for joyless living and then the outpouring or the, the effect of a joyful life on us as human beings. So first off, the enemy. The enemy of joy really is distraction. 
It's distraction. Because, and, and because this joy is something that is uniquely found in God, it's something that you can't experience outside of God. You can experience happiness. I mean, you can be an atheist and be a happy person. But this joy that the angels talked about, that's only found in relationship with God. And the distractions we have are the things that take our eyes off of that. You see, because Satan, he doesn't need to win our heart. Satan doesn't have to get you to stop believing in God. Satan doesn't have to make you a mass murderer. Satan doesn't have to make you anything like that. All he has to do is to distract you. Satan doesn't have to win our heart. He just has to distract it long enough for us to get used to focusing on a life outside of Jesus. When one is distracted, we keep our eyes fixed on something other than Jesus, and we get used to it. And because of that, we miss out on the greatest joy of this world. Now, there's a lot of things that distract us. They're not all bad things. We can actually get distracted by really good things. Like when good, really good things happen in your life, sometimes it's really easy to kick God to the curb and forget about him. He's back burner. You don't even stop believing in him. You're just distracted with other things that are going on in life. We get busy. So there's some good things. But also, also there's areas of sin in our life that distract us from, from, the, from focusing on Jesus. But during this time of year, I'm just going to focus on three C's of distraction that we see typically in this time of year that distract us from the, the joy of, of the Lord. And that one of them is conflict. This time of year is bizarre because it's like almost like the thing that is supposed to intend or is intended to bring us into such a worshipful place of the person who, of who God is and his forgiveness of us we actually can enter into family drama like no other. I mean, it's bizarre how this happens. And one of the things about conflict is this. We are, the reason that this distracts us from joy is because it's all-consuming. So if you have conflict in your family, if you have conflict in a relationship, if you have conflict with people that you're doing life with, sometimes that could become all-consuming. I am one of the best compartmentalizers out there. Something, you can ask Julie, something bad happens to me, it's going to ding me, and then I'm going to move on. It's like, oh, here's a little box. Here's this, oh, I hate this. Whoop, blip, whoa, and I'm walking away. I don't even care. That's, and I, I do that. But there's a few things in life that I can't do that with. And one of the areas that I really, really struggle with is this with my, with my uh, ex extended family. And for some reason, I don't know what it is, it's December that brings it up. Because it's December when we're starting to see who's coming and who's not. Who's staying away and why, who's staying away and why are they staying away? Like in a week's time, McFadden's are descending upon Manuka. <laughs> and there's a part of me, in years past, that has let this steal, rob, distract my joy. And Julie's like, I don't understand what it is. Like a lot of stuff happens in life that stresses you out or anxiety or whatever, but this is something that just overcomes you. I'm like, I don't know what it is. Maybe that is the same way it is for you. And the reason that it's a distraction of joy and the reason why it's wrong is because it's all consuming. Sometimes we just need an escape from the tension. And you know exactly where we go, to our cell phones. That's the second distraction. That's the sea of cell phones. Cell phones are something that are just this amazing device that we have the capacity to enjoy. But we don't just enjoy them. We're all consumed by them. Um, one person put it this way. When you wake up, you either check your phone before you go to the bathroom or while you go to the bathroom. But there is no other option. Now, some of you are like, that's disgusting. I... Don't know anybody like that. Yes, you do. Why is that? It's because the fact that as we are going through life, we're conditioned with this reality of I need this. This thing is where I get my news, my weather. I contact the people I care about. I contact the people I don't care about. This is the thing that reminds me if there's something I should be reminded about. It's my calendar. It's my brain. This, if someone wants to let me, if, if I need to be at an appointment, this tells me that. If something happens out in the world, bing, it lets me know that. I am constantly glued to this. This is the source of my social, vocational, interpersonal reality. This is your small g God that you carry around in your pocket, and when it beckons, you answer. Don't you? We do. Now, cell phones aren't bad. In fact, I think they're one of the most amazing instruments that we can use for so many different things that are so good. But what they actually cause us to do is to be distracted from our greatest joy. 
the joy that's found in Jesus. Why? Because they become all-consuming. Um, this, uh, this lady named Linda Stone, she was the former Apple and Microsoft consultant. Um, she talked about some of these side effects of cell phone use that have caused an already distracted culture to be more distracted, and she called it CPA, continuous partial attention disorder. And basically, this is how she, she uh, framed it. By adopting an always-on, anywhere, anytime, any place behavior, we exist in a constant state of alertness that scans the world, but never really gives our full attention to anything. She continues, in the short term, we adapt well to these demands, but in the long term, the stress hormones, adrenaline, and cortisol create a physiological hyper-alert state that is always scanning for stimuli, provoking a sense of addiction temporarily assuaged by checking in. This is us. This is who we are. And again, the key thing to this is the, the reality, the reason that this is something that is off for the Christian to be like so dialed in is because of the fact that it is all-consuming. Now, here's the thing. We, we, Julie and I, we used to call out our kids for being like, you know, constantly praying to the glowing rectangle in their palm. But you, uh, many, year, many years back, you'd go to a Christmas gathering or a Thanksgiving gathering, and you would see like the younger, like 20, let's just say 20-somethings and younger all on their phone. And the old people are like, gosh, what's wrong with today's generation? And then old people discovered cell phones. And you walk into any family gathering now, and whether you're eight or 80, right? What if we recognize that this could be distracting us, our always dialed in, all-consuming devotion to this is something that needs to be put aside for times? The third C is consumerism. Um, we, we, and just in short, I love gifts. I love giving gifts. I love receiving gifts. Gifts are great. Christmas is a lot of this. But we, we make this something to the point where Christmas is seen as the, an, a vehicle to give gifts. I remember talking with someone that was really broken up about the fact that they lost their job. And the response that they had to losing their job was, I feel so anxious and sad and discouraged in my heart because Finances are so tough. I don't know if we're going to be able to have Christmas this year. And I remember thinking, wait, hold on. Christmas is going to happen, dude. Well, your finances have nothing to do with Christmas. But when gifts are the all-consuming focus, what we're giving, how much we can give, or what we're receiving, we are distracted from the truest joy, which is really goofy. Because remember what you got in 2018 for Christmas? Remember how awesome that was, that, that gift? That thing that you still like look at the same way as you did when you opened it in 20... Remember that? We put so much focus and emphasis on things that are so temporary. We get consumed by them, and in so doing, we get distracted. Satan does not have to win our heart. He just has to distract it long enough for us to get used to focusing on a life outside of Jesus. But instead, the psalmist again says, but bring joy to your servant, Lord. And he continues, for I put my trust in you, for you are great and do marvelous deeds, etc., etc. Bring joy to your servant. And then he gets down here, give me a what? Undivided heart. David is saying, I have the propensity to have a divided, distracted heart, distracting me from the essence of who I am and the essence from the fact that you are the joy giver. You are the one who is the one who gives me the, something better than happiness, something more permanent than happiness, something more resilient than happiness, and you're the one that could give it. God, give me an undivided, undistracted heart. And you know what David's avenue to experiencing this joy is? Worship. For I put my trust in you. Listen to the worshipful response that David has. For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Worship is, say, worship is not melody. It's not song. You could worship in a song, but it's more than that. In fact, one of the things I love about what Pastor Carlos has brought to our church is this notion that worship is not something that we do in here exclusively with a song. What does Carlos always say? He says, don't come to church to worship. What? Bring your worship to church. 
That means that you've got six days of worship outside of this building where you're not singing. And if you were singing all throughout that time, you're living a musical. And that's awesome. But that's not reality for most of us. And it's not what Scripture's calling us to do. Worship is responding to God by saying, this is what you have done and this is who you are. I am praising you because of what you have done, and I'm praising you for who you are. That is the essence of worship. Romans 1 talks about that being the key thing that we derail our life by not doing. Honoring God for who he is and honoring God for what he has done. What does David do? I put my trust in you, for you are great, and you are marvelous. You have marvelous deeds. You do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. And his response is a worshipful response. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart. We have an enemy of joy and it's distraction. The remedy for, an un, for a divided heart is, in fact, worship. But we don't treat God like that. We treat God like he's like a vending machine. All right, I've got some candy here. All right. Uh, oh, I didn't have to say anything. Okay. <laughs> First service is like, I'm on a diet. Second service is like, bring it on. It's December. All right. Okay. 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 We got some M&Ms. All right. Ready? <laughs> Jake, that's for you. I'm an athlete. All right. Uh, okay. Let's see. Okay. Who else? This is like, okay, here's some joy. Who would like some joy over here? All right. Oh, man. Very nice. Okay, okay. Who would like to? Oh, okay, okay. Let's see. Craig? I meant, uh, yes, good, okay. A lot of times when we're asking God for joy, that's what we're doing. I need joy. I need joy over here. God, I need joy over here. But that's not how God gives joy. He's not a vending machine of joy. In fact, God doesn't grant joy outside of a relationship with him. This is something that Chris Garcia taught on, I believe, last week at 360. God doesn't grant joy outside of a relationship with him. Who else would like one? Cohen? Okay, Cohen, come on. This is what God does. Ah, Hold on a sec. Oh, boy. Well, Sam and Cohen... What joy does, or what God does with joy, is this. God came down. He came down. He's not dispensing joy from a distance. God, to bring joy to us, came to us. He took the first step. And then what happens is this. He calls us to follow him. And we get to experience joy with him in proximity to him. We don't experience joy outside of him. (laughs) All right. Good job, guys. Now, here's the thing, though. That makes sense, but that's not how we live. We live like God's supposed to be this vending machine of whatever we're praying for. I need joy. Give it to me. And God's like, no, I don't grant, I'm not granting this from a distance. Joy for me, my divine joy is in my presence. In fact, David in another uh, psalm says this, in your presence there is what? Fullness of joy. In your presence. If you're seeking joy in a relationship, in gifts, in some type of family unity that has not yet happened and you're waiting and anticipating and you're consumed by, the, by materialism or you're consumed by your device, you're consumed by the family that you're trying to put back together and that's where you're trying to get joy, you will have momentary happiness followed by endless discouragement. However, the fullness of joy is found in God's presence. The enemy of your joy is distracting from this divine joy. The remedy, the remedy is worship. Rightfully placing God in in the position of in your life where he is the leader. Where you're worshiping him with your decisions. He's the boss. And that actually leads us to the effect of a joy-filled life, which is this. It's a life well lived. Again, in 86... He says this, bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you, for you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may what? Fear your name. 
You know, some people, uh, and I think most Christians that ask the question, man, this sounds weird, because how, if God loves me, why am I supposed to be afraid of him? Why am I supposed to fear his name? Like, like you know, why, why, why would that be, a, why is that something that I'm supposed to be, you know, if God is relational, if he's someone who loves me, why am I afraid of him? And this isn't fearing him like he's a serial killer or like you're like trying to like book it away from him like Adam and Eve did when they were recognizing their sin. This is a fear that is actually a response to the mightiness of God. And if anyone has an issue with the fear of God, I just want to say, buy yourself a ticket, fly out to California and go to Yosemite National Park. It's in Yosemite National Park that you're going to see something. One of the things that um, I had an opportunity to do when Micah was 13 was uh, we went backpacking um, in, the, in the area, in the backcountry around Yosemite Valley. So this, is a, this photo is taken from Yosemite Valley floor, 4,000 feet. Up at 8,000 feet is where the backcountry is. And so we had to come into the, the, the valley at first. And when we're driving in, it was dark and it was stormy and it was just pouring down rain, tons of rain. And it was just like Mike had fallen asleep. Uh, we were going to put up a tent and backpack, but we couldn't because there was so much rain. It was washing out all of the camping sites in, in the valley floor. And so we're just desperately looking around. And I'm kind of panicking as a dad who's bringing his 13-year-old son away from home, 2,000 miles, and we're in a really precarious situation. But then the rain stopped. And the wind blew all of those clouds away and all the rain and all the things that, that diffused the sky around us. And I remember looking up and seeing these just ginormous, towering cliffs of granite all around us. And my response was fear. It was terrifying. It was the magnitude of them. I'm from Illinois. We have mountains when people put in a subdivision, there's like a little like dirt hill. (laughs) That's the mountains that Mike and I had climbed up to this point. And all of a sudden, I'm in, in, now I had been to Yosemite tons of times growing up, but there's something about not seeing those on a regular basis and then seeing them in the dark where the moon's hitting them that caused me both fear and joy with the idea of what would happen, what would happen if I could get a chance to explore them more. I was both like terrified and drawn to them at the same time. This is what many of you have experienced in worship, maybe in worship and song, where you've been worshiping, and then all of a sudden, the magnitude of who God is and what God has done for you comes together, and you are blown away with a sense of, the only word to describe it is joy. When I was, when I was uh, in high school, my junior year, I was at a camp in, in California called Thousand Pines, and I was in Jensen Chapel, and I, and I was standing there, and I was in the, we were in the middle of worship, and I had a profound experience about what God wanted me to do with the rest of my life. And it wasn't like, Earl, the land I'm calling to you is called Manuka. <laughs> that didn't happen. I'm staying there in worship, and what, what I had been going through up to that point is this battling with God, sensing that God wanted me to do ministry, and wanting me, and I personally wanting to do anything other than being a pastor. I grew up in a pastor's home. I know what that was like. I know, and I saw what it was. I, there was all these reasons why ministry for me was the last thing on planet earth I wanted to pursue. Absolute last thing. And all those reasons I had, had just sturdied and steeled up inside of my heart, and in the midst of a song, a worship song focusing on the power and grace of God, All of a sudden, I sensed this is like melting of my reservations and melting of my defenses. And this this idea of God, I want to do whatever you want me to do. And I'm terrified at what you're going to ask me to do. But I'm open to whatever it is. And that moment, the one word I can use, and as scary as my future was, as scary as it is following a God who can call you to do crazy things, I sensed in that moment joy. I've watched it in, in the eyes and in the, the conversations with people in our church. Um, I was talking with someone at one point who wrestles just with mental struggles, um, anxiety, panic attacks, and stuff like that. So a lot of life is a struggle, a wrestling match with that. And this person um, was serving in one of our student ministries and said, the weirdest thing in the world to me is this. When I'm serving these junior hires, it's like all of a sudden I experienced a joy 
that nothing else has ever touched. Who says that about junior hires? <laughs> Somebody who is living a life well lived by living in the fear of God, the magnitude and majesty of a God who's sovereign and yet full of love and grace for us, who calls us into proximity. He desires and loves us to desire and love him and to say yes to him. I've sat next to beds with people in our churches. They've been minutes away from dying. And even though the fear of death is something that is on everyone's mind, the reality of the fear of God is so much greater. And this person who's connected to God through Jesus is smiling because he is going to see Jesus face to face in moments. Who does that? Someone who's full of joy, whose life is rightly placed by worshiping. Nehemiah put it this way. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. He continues, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. Folks, if you are currently living a joyless life, the joyful life is a life of worship, a life of worshiping God, of elevating your eyes off of the things that distract you. Because when God is elevated, so are your spirits. When God is elevated in your life, so are your spirits. If you're, if, what is the thing that's distracting you from that? What is the thing that's causing your focus to be so fixated and consumed that you're missing that? When God is elevated, so are our spirits, and we experience joy. So this is a question that we should be asking. What is distracting me from worshiping God with my life? What's stealing my, my attention and my focus and my worship of God? What decisions am I making that are keeping me in a place of holding God at arm's length? Is it the typical seasonal stuff or is it something else? Because the reality of what happens is when we fix our eyes on Jesus, we are worshiping the one true God. And when we worship the one true God, the byproduct is receiving that gift and enjoying the gift that he established that those angels proclaimed to the shepherds in the fields. That this joy, great joy, is for all people, including you. Amen? Amen. Let's stand for prayer. Lord Jesus, we are a distracted people. We confess to you the fact that um, we get distracted for all the wrong reasons and we get distracted for all the right reasons. The amount of variables in our life, the people we care about or the people we're, we're responsible for or the goals that we have, God, these are all things that can be amazing and awesome, but it's so easy for us to side rail and sidetrack the reality that you've come to establish in your followers, which is joyful lives. Lord, I pray that you help us live out the joy of the Lord, that it in fact is our strength. Lord, I pray that in the midst of being joyful, that if we are joyful in you, that you'll remind our face and allow that to be something that we're reflecting to the world around us, that we have a joy that defies the gifts that can be given or received that defies the parties that can be had or attended, that defies even the best scenarios of families coming together. We have a joy that could happen when none of those things take place because our joy is rooted in your work for us, what you accomplished on the cross, in your death and resurrection, Jesus, not on the circumstances we see in December of 2021. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for who you are, and what you've done. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen, amen. Members, we'll be meeting here in under 40 minutes. Everyone else, we'll see you next week. Thanks for joining.